the scriptures are very clear. The message of salvation, salvation itself is for the Jews first, then for the Gentiles. It says that over and over in the scripture. God has a very, very special place in his heart for Jewish people. But if you preach the modern day Christian message, message to Jews today, there'll be one objection that will inevitably come up. And that is, they will tell you that the scriptures say that one man cannot die for the sins of another. They will quote from Deuteronomy chapter 24, Ezekiel chapter 18. And they'll say, listen, it says there very clearly, the soul that sins shall die. Not another person. It says very clearly, someone else cannot die for someone else's sin. But you see, today's modern day Christian evangelical message will, you know, tells you that Jesus died for your sins. It's like, I heard it, I heard it explained like this, you know, very, very mild here. Let's say you're, you're charged with trespassing or something like that. And you go to court and the judge rules that you're to pay either $10,000 or two months in court, or excuse me, two months in jail. And then someone stands up in the courtroom and says, Your Honor, if it please the court, I will pay the $10,000 for this person so that he can go free. And they, they say that this is what salvation is like. This is what Jesus did for us. He basically stood up in the heavenly courts and he said, I'll pay the penalty of sin so that these my people will go free. Now, that sounds so good and it sounds so right and it sounds so Christian. But if you do put it up to scriptures like Deuteronomy chapter 24 and Ezekiel chapter 18, and also just the simple basic concept of sacrifice in the scriptures. I mean, a lot of Christians will tell you that the sacrifice of Jesus is all based upon the sacrificial system that we see in what they call the Old Testament. So that it's just fulfilling, you know, the sacrifice, the sacrificial system of the Old Testament. So we got a problem here. We've got Jews or the Jewish mindset, the Jewish way of looking at it, and plus other people. I mean, lots of other people could read uh, the Tanakh and read uh, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 24, Ezekiel chapter 18 and say, well, yeah, it does say that no one else will die for the sins of another man. And you see, this is the problem that, that, that so many people get deceived by today they believe that jesus is just there's like it's it's like he's a substitute and that's it okay like he died so that i can live he died so that i can go free and you know in a very vague in a very uh you know in a very blurred blurred sense of the word in a very general sense of the word that could that may be true however um, it's much more than that. The sacrificial system of the, the Torah, um, in particular, let's say the sacrificial system that is given to us by Moses, and that's what many Christians say, that's what it's based upon, that Jesus is our lamb. Jesus is our lamb, our sin sacrifice. John the Baptist, when he first saw Jesus, you know, he introduced Jesus and he said, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. That's a mouthful. That's a mouthful. Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Okay? And this, that's basically the foundation where I'm, this is where I'm going. Okay? I'm, let's use that as a foundation. There's many times in the scriptures where Jesus or, you know, the Lord would say and God would speak to a prophet or Jesus would speak to his disciples. And, you know, the, the, you know, the prophet or the uh, disciples would say, you know, Lord, what do you mean? What do you mean? Show me. What do you mean by this? But when John the Baptist said, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, nobody said, what do you mean? They all knew what he meant. They all knew what the purpose 
they all knew what the function of the Lamb of God was, okay? Now, if you were to ask any Jewish person today, you know, ask a good, knowledgeable Jewish rabbi today, what was the purpose of animal sacrifices? They will tell you. They, um, let me just back up a step. They won't tell you that it's, oh, that, that animal pays the full penalty of your sin. Okay, see where I'm going with this? Jesus is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. True. But the Lamb of God, sin sacrifice in the Torah, has got nothing to do, it's not like substitutionary in the sense of, well, that animal dies so I don't have to die, or that animal takes the penalty of my sin. No. The idea is, and this is what the rabbis would tell you, okay? This is what the rabbis would tell you. Any knowledgeable rabbi that's, that's worth his weight, you know, and he would tell you that when you, you're caught up in a sin, you take that animal, be it a you know, lamb or whatever it may be, as a sin sacrifice. Of course, it's got to be a, a, a perfect uh, animal without blemish, you know, without defect. Take it to the to the uh, to the temple, or take it to the tabernacle for the priest to sacrifice it. And you wa- and you stay there, and you watch it being sacrificed. You watch the knife go into its throat. You watch the blood flowing. You watch that animal die. And when you do, when you as you watch that animal die, die, you know, being being sacrificed, you are to identify with that animal. You are to say, as that blood is flowing out, gushing out, as the life of that animal is draining out of it, so the life of my sin is draining out. As the fat of that animal was burned on, on the altar, so the passion and the lust for, my, for the sin that I'm caught up in is burned away. So that you can say, and this is where Paul got his saying from in Galatians two, uh, Galatians two twenty. I am crucified with Christ. Okay, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live; yet not I, but Christ lives in me. Okay, Galatians five twenty four. Those who belong to Christ, those who belong to Jesus, have crucified their sinful nature. How did they crucify? By looking upon the lamb as they did in the days of Moses and identifying with that lamb. As that animal dies, I am connecting with that. That lamb was a prophetic expression of a spiritual, uh, of, of a spiritual, of profound spiritual truth. In other words, when that, when that animal was sacrificed, that, what, that is to be a prophetic expression of, of you yourself, your sinful desires, your sin being sacrificed. You know, Galatians uh, 5.24, those who belong to Christ have crucified their sinful nature. Uh, Colossians chapter 2, you're dead to sin. Romans chapter 6, how can you who are dead to sin live in it, live in it any longer? So you're dead to sin. How? By faith in the Messiah, by faith in Yeshua, Jesus. When he died, you look upon that sacrifice and you say, I am crucified with him. When he rose, of course, I rise with him in newness of life. Now, you don't see anything talking about the penalty for sin. Rather, it is a catalyst. Okay, this is what the Lamb of God is for. This is what sin sacrifices. This is the, this is the basic principle the building blocks, the way it works, sin sacrifice is, is for a, to be used as a catalyst for repentance. Say you have a sin in your life and you have a hard time um, overcoming this sin. You need to have something that you can connect to. You need to have something that you can that you can actually say, hey, you know what? My I need to have something that is um uh that is in this real, in like a real world physical uh, expression of something that, you know, basically, what do they call it? Uh, synchronicity, where you got something in the natural realm synchronizing with something in the spiritual realm, okay? So, um, 
yeah, like you have to look at it like this. When Jesus died, he did not take the full penalty of sin. What is the full penalty of sin? Okay, let's look at I just got a few things written down here. Isaiah 33 verse 14 says, uh, The sinners of, of Sion are afraid. Fearfulness has surprised the hypocrites. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Among Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? Okay, again in Isaiah 34, 8 to 10. The Lord has a day of vengeance. It goes on to say it will not be quenched. The fire, the vengeance of God will not be quenched night or day. Its smoke will rise forever. Some people believe that when you die, that's it. Or the penalty of sin is death and that's it. It's just like, you know, the, the soul that sins shall die, that's it. You just die and that's, that's the penalty for, for sin. If that's the case, everybody pays their own sin. Everybody pay. Why would you need Jesus to die for you? You're going to die. I mean, hello, okay? And there are people that believe that. They believe that, you know, there's no such thing as really a, a, an everlasting hell. It's just you die. And, and that death is the penalty for your sins. So Jesus died for our sins. I mean, let's go on here. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 2, talks about the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. Not just a one-time thing. Eternal judgment. Jude chapter 7, the, pe the people of Sodom and Gomorrah serve, it, serve as an example for those who suffer the punishment of eternal fires. Okay? And again, some people believe it's just that you're just consumed, that God will just consume you by fire, and that's it, that's it, that's it for you. Well, if that's, a, if that's the case, the fire won't last very long. I mean, uh, why would it say the smoke of, of your uh, torment will, will, will rise forever and ever? Uh, um, Revelation chapter 14, verses 10 to 11. The smoke of their torment, speaking of the false prophet, the beast and such, and we know Jesus said, this is hell. This is what hell was created for, for, you know, uh, the devil and, and, you know, and his uh, cohorts, so to speak. Okay. So why would it say that the smoke of their torment rises forever if they don't burn forever? They got to burn forever in order for the smoke to rise, to keep on going, to keep on going forever. Okay. Uh, Daniel 12, verse 2, some will rise to everlasting life. And, and others will rise to shame and everlasting contempt. Okay? 2 Thessalonians 1.9, Paul says, They will be punished with everlasting destruction. Galatians 1 verse 8, If someone preaches another gospel, he is to be eternally condemned. Mark 3 verse 29, Jesus said, Those who blaspheme will be guilty of an eternal sin. Eternal sin. Okay, now that's just a few. That's just a few things. I, I mean, Luke chapter sixteen is a good one too. You know, Jesus said about the rich man going to hell, and he was there. He could not get out. Once you're there, you cannot get out. It, it's, Jesus made it very clear. There was a chasm. There's like a great gulf, a great ca a canyon, so to speak, uh, between heaven and and hell. And those who want to pass from hell to heaven cannot. And those, I mean, who would want to go from heaven to hell except for to save those who are in hell? But even then, they cannot. Once you're there, you're there. Okay? Then you got all of the witnesses of the people. I mean, all the people in the world, all over the world, from all different faiths, even atheists, to all different faiths, all over the world, who have died and experienced hell. And, you know, generally speaking, they all come back with pretty much the same story. They talk about darkness. They talk about fire. They talk about torment, tor people being tormented forever. You, ne you never hear someone say, well, you know what? I died. I went to hell and I saw good old Uncle Jack there. And Uncle Jack said, well, you know what? I have uh, five more hours to go and I'll be out of here. <laughs> never. Never. Okay? Hell is forever. The etern the the full wrath of God on sin is eternity in hell. Jesus did not spend eternity in hell or else he'd still be there. Okay? No, he did not pay the full penalty of sin. It's not about paying a penalty, okay? It's not like someone can pay, you know, somebody made this uh, uh, analogy. It's like, well, you get a traffic ticket and someone can go pay it for you. 
Well, that's a very frivolous and a very shallow way of looking at it because that's got to do with an external thing. I mean, the courts don't really care. It's not got to do with anything personal. It's not like you have your license, your, your licenses to be removed unless you do have lots of traffic convictions and you do disobey the law where your license will be revoked. Then I guarantee you, well, I mean, I don't know about all the governments of the world, but I'm pretty sure you wouldn't have... It wouldn't be easy for you to have just good old Joe Blow to walk in off the street and say, you know what, this guy over here, you know, I know that he was drinking and driving and he killed 20 people and he keeps on drinking and you want to re revoke his license for life? Revoke my license instead. Uh, keep his license. Keep him on the road. You think they're going to do that? <laughs> of course not, okay? Again, it's like the Bible says, the soul that sins shall pay, Okay. When it comes to that kind of thing, when it comes to a personal thing or what to do with you, what to do with your license, not just um, money. It's like, you know, traffic tickets like any old person can pay. Any old, per like any old person can pay the traffic ticket and the court doesn't care. Let's say if you're convicted of murder, okay? If you're convicted of mor murder, uh, it's not like the court, the judge is going to say, okay, um, Okay, let's see here. Someone's got to go to go to jail for this, or someone's got to be executed for this murder. Let's see. Just any old person will do. I mean, the murderer himself, he can go free. It just We just need someone to pay the debt. I don't know. That's ridiculous, isn't it? But that's the way some of these Christians act, like as if someone can pay the penalty of their sin. Now, the, the Bible is very clear, okay? If you repent of your sin, God will not hold it against you, Okay? It says that very clear in Ezekiel. It says that very clear in Proverbs. I mean, those who repent will find mercy. Okay? If you repent, if you live 20 years in sin, and then all of a sudden the last two years, you're, you're righteous now. You're a saint. You've, you've renounced. You've, you've changed your life. You've changed the way you live. God's not going to hold the sin against you, it says. You know, you can find mercy because you have changed. You have really repented. You've, you've changed. And same goes, as Ezekiel makes it very clear, same goes with those who are righteous and repent from their righteousness and start to do wickedness. God says, I'm not going to hold the righteousness. I'm not going to use the righteousness, you know, for it's not going to do anything for you because now you got all this sin that you're in currently now. So all the good things that you did before is not going to be, I'm not going to reward you for that at all. You know, you're going to be it's going to be counted as nothing because you've repented from that. So God looks at your current state. Are you repented? Have you repented from your sin? So it's all about repentance. From Genesis to Revelation and beyond, <laughs> either way, eternally, it is all about repentance. The first thing Jesus preached was repentance. The first thing the apostles preached was repentance. What the prophets of old preached was repentance. But the first thing, what, I mean, the, the message of the book of Acts, we, we see repent, repent. God commands every man everywhere to repent. Even Jesus said to his church in, in the book of Revelation, chapter 2 and 3, repent, 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 or else. Serious, serious, serious punishment if you don't repent, okay? So it's all about repentance. And a lot of people need this catalyst to repent. So they need to have something to connect to on a spiritual level. They need to have something to connect to. And that's why, you see, Jesus died. So that we can look upon him and say, I am crucified with Christ. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. That's what he wants you to say. He wants you to say, I am dead to sin. Therefore, I cannot live in it any longer. That's what he wants you to say. A lot of people don't even know what sin is. So they, I mean, sin is, to make it very clear, like, to make it very clear for those, I mean, a child can tell you, but I know with a lot of these theological folk anymore, they just mess it up completely. But sin is breaking God's law, breaking, you know, going against the law of God as it is written in the scriptures. Okay? Very clear. You transgress, you transgress the law, you, you sin. As, as John said, you know, sin is the transgression of the law. Okay? So if you sin, you need to repent. And a lot of you need this extra power, this extra help to repent. Jesus came, he died, so that you can identify with him. So yes, Jesus really didn't die for us in the sense that, um, that he paid the penalty of our sin. 
you know, so that, I mean, he didn't die for us in the, in the sense that Deuteronomy chapter 24 is talking about and, 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 and Ezekiel chapter 18 is talking about. He died for us in the sense that he died, he suffered as being a righteous man, and he died so that we could identify with him and so that we could repent. So, I mean, that's what grace is all about. Any kind of grace that just winks at sin, any kind of grace that just covers sin, is false, phony, weak, pathetic grace, okay? God's grace is powerful enough to deliver you from sin. And this brings me right back to what John the Baptist said. Jesus is the Lamb of God. The purpose and the function of of the Lamb of God was not to pay the price for sin, but rather to be a catalyst for repentance. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Not covers it, not winks at it, not excuses it, but takes it away. How does does Jesus take away the sin of the world? By giving you power over sin. So if you're struggling with sin in your life, look upon him, look upon the cross. Remember, the truth sets you free. Jesus said, if you know the truth, the truth will make you free. So walk in that power. Walk in that grace. Walk in righteousness according to God's will, God's ways, God's law, and God's word. Thanks again for watching.